Hey guys, I want to talk about the microbiome today and give you a little insight on what I know about the microbiome. Um, we're just scratching the surface in medicine about the microbiome, but I want to walk you through a little bit about what I know as well as present to you a new article that um, I just got today. It was released in March of 2017. So my name is Dr. Philip Oob. I'm a functional medicine doctor in um, Austin, Texas, and let's talk a little bit about the microbiome. So first of all, the basics of the microbiome. Um, the microbiome is just a way to collectively refer to all the bacteria and fungus and, um, and things that are going on inside your bowels that help you every day digest your food. It is a medical fact that we cannot live without our microbiome. If your bowels were to go sterile, you would basically die. It, we, you cannot live without those bacteria and many of them can't live without us. So we have a symbiotic relationship with these bacteria. They help us break down foods that we can't break down. They help us um, absorb nutrients that otherwise we wouldn't be able to absorb. They help change nutrients into ways that we can absorb them, as well as we create chemicals and compounds that they survive off of. Now, it is true that they may try to invade us and try to kill us every now and then. That's just natural uh, selection. If we're dying and they can take over, then they will try to take over. There is more bacterial DNA in your bowels than there is DNA in your whole human body. That's how important this is. And without that myriad of DNA, we can't um, process as many things as we would like to process. So more and more data is being poured into, into this microbiome and more and more research is coming out about it to really learn what are the implications of it. Even in medical school, in conventional medicine, um, we were taught the link between uh, certain bacterial strains and autoimmune diseases and little was known about this connection and why it exists and, and what, what's going on with that, why does it happen, um, but it's there nonetheless. We are intimately connected to the bacteria in our bowels and we need them and we need fungus too. A lot of functional medicine practitioners go on this yeast eradication and um, it's important to know that yeast and fungus is among us. It is supposed to be with us but it's not supposed to be an overgrowth or um, overgrowing and it's not supposed to be inflammatory. So there is yeast levels that are a problem, but it's also important to know that they don't need to be completely eradicated, just like modern medicine needs to give up on this eradicating microbes thing that we've gone in. If you, if you have a cough or a sneeze or a runny nose, you need antibiotics, you need to eradicate those bacteria. So <clears throat> I want to specifically with this video talk about this study that I got because it is straight out of a conventional medical journal and it's astounding what they found out. So this is from the Lancet Medical Journal, which you may not know is a pretty reputable uh, journal and they're talking about fecal transplantation. And in case you don't know what that is, that's basically taking poop from another human being and putting it in a different human being. And so while that sounds disgusting, and we may not talk about the details of how you get poop from one individual to another, um, I will discuss why that works. So the idea is that people who are healthy, quote unquote, meaning they may not have any symptoms, have a diverse microbiome. It's said that the microbiome, a healthy individual, has a more diverse microbiome than the rainforest, meaning if you took a square foot of rainforest and counted how many different organisms, including plants and animals and grubs and protozoa and whatever, you would have a more diverse um, e ecosystem in your bowels than you would in the rainforest. So they're taking people that have ulcerative colitis who are sick, who have an autoimmune disease. Ulcerative colitis is an autoimmune disease where the body's attacking its own colon. That's why it's called ulcerative colitis because the body's attacking the colon so intensely that it's creating ulcers in it. And you can see it with a colonoscope or colonoscopy. And so basically they took healthy people that donated their poop. Uh, I don't know how you sign up for that, but they took their, their healthy people poop and then they gave it to the unhealthy people with ulcerative colitis. And the question they asked was, um, does fecal transplant, transplantation improve outcomes in patients with ulcerative colitis? It did. So let me just spoil the alert. It did improve outcomes. But I want to tell you how important this is. So in functional medicine, we're really working on the diet, we're removing food triggers, we're balancing vitamin levels, balancing hormones, stress reduction, doing all kinds of things. These guys didn't do any of that. All they did was take poop from one individual, from a healthy individual, and put it in a sick individual to find out what happened. And they had astounding results. So imagine if conventional medicine took this even further and changed people's diet and removed gluten and removed dairy and tested for food sensitivities and removed those foods, what kind of results they would get if they did all of that. 
So in this small study, patients were pulled into the study if they had active ulcerative colitis. Not someone that's got ulcerative colitis, but kind of in remission. These were active ulcerative colitis, meaning they had ulcerative colitis within the past three months, and they gave them a symptom quiz and said you had to have X amount of symptoms in order to be enrolled in the study. So when they were enrolled in the study, they had a colonoscopy, a colonoscope going up their rectum, and they took pictures of the disease and had to have disease in order to be included in the study and then they, get, they got their first fecal transplant with the colonoscope. So what they do is they go all the way into the bowels and then they basically dump the feces from the healthy individual into the unhealthy individual. And then after that, the patients themselves had to self-administer feces. So yes, they had to take poop from other individuals and give themselves enemas, meaning a tube up their bottom, with healthy individual poop to try to restore their own poop. So it turns out that after eight weeks, um, these patients weren't allowed to take any steroids. They were allowed to take other agents um, like mercaptopurine or anything else that they might have been on, but no steroids. And um, there was a placebo group. So one group was given, half the people were given placebo and half the people were given active poop. And in order to disguise the placebo, they actually made it smell like poop, which I don't understand how they did that. But the placebo group even smelled like poop, so they couldn't tell the difference. And by the end of the eight weeks, the numbers that improved were 27% of the 40 people. It was a small group. Each group had about 40 people. 27% of the people that did the fecal transplants had improvement in symptoms and did not require steroids and did not require any other treatments. 27%. In the placebo group, the fake poop smelling capsules and, or enemas, sorry, fake poop smelling enemas, only 8% of them got better. So that's a 20% difference. 27% got better in the treated group and 8% got better in the placebo group. That's impressive. They didn't do anything else. All they did was got poop from another individual. So what does that tell you? That tells you that if you have ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and any autoimmune disease, your microbes are what's creating your um, autoimmunity. And it's not necessarily the microbes that are creating the autoimmunity, I kind of misspoke. It's somehow, and we don't fully understand it yet, somehow the interaction between the microbes, the bacteria, the fungus, and your own intestinal cells creates an inflammatory response that leads to ulcerative colitis. So if there's anything that you can do to restore that microbiome, that bacterial balance, that yeast balance, then your symptoms get better. So currently fecal transplantation is ruled by the FDA as a drug, so it's not available. You're welcome to go take someone else's poop and give yourself an enema, but we can't really recommend that. Um, and we can't prescribe that, and we can't prescribe healthy individuals poop enemas or anything. We're not to that point yet. It's sad. But what this is telling you is that by taking probiotics, by getting healthy bacteria back in your bowels, you can reverse your autoimmune disease. When I was reading um, Dr. Perlmutter's book, uh, Brain Maker, he talked about probiotic enemas. And so I would like to encourage you, if you have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or any autoimmune condition, you want to restore the microbes in your large intestine. Whenever you take probiotics by mouth, um, the probiotics have to go through your teeth, through the saliva, through your stomach, through your small bowels, and then land in your large bowels in order to really take seed and, and stay and live and thrive. That's a long, perilous journey to go from your mouth all the way to your colon. And it has to go through numerous traps, enzymes and stomach acid and digestive juices and the immune system in order to finally land in the large bowel. You may not know this, but most of your microbiome lives in your large bowel, not your small bowel. In fact, if you have too many microbes, too many bacteria in your small bowel, we call that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, meaning you've got too many bacteria there, and that, actually, that can actually cause a lot of bloating and indigestion after meals, because basically your microbes are eating the food before you eat the food, and then their byproducts are gas, so then you get bloated and uncomfortable. So the majority of your microbes are in your large bowel, so instead of taking probiotics by mouth, you can actually do probiotic enemas and I learned this in uh, Dr. Perlmutter's book Brain Maker. He referenced some good studies in regards to probiotic enemas. Um, I don't have it right now but what we do in my practice for probiotic enemas if you want to try this yourself um, you can buy an enema kit over the counter. We, we sell them in my practice. But basically, you can take probiotics and a capsule or powder or whatnot and mix it in some water, put it in an enema bag, and infuse it into yourself and hold it there for 30 seconds to try to hold that bacteria as long as you can. Since it's liquid, you will naturally want to um, go to the bathroom, but if you can hold it for 30 minutes, that's beneficial. When you're doing an enema transplant, or a, I'm sorry, a fecal transplant, then that's actually poop, so it, it gives you less of a desire to go to the bathroom because that's 
kind of what's supposed to be there. Um, so it's easier to maintain and hold on to that. Not to mention, whenever you do a fecal transplant, that is the bacteria in their normal environment. They're used to surviving in poop. Um, and so it's much more likely to stick than say a probiotic enema. So whenever we do a probiotic enema at Oob Medical, um, instead of using regular probiotic capsules that you may get over the counter, say the highest dose I can usually find is about 25 billion inside a, a really high quality probiotic. Um, what we use is we use the VSO number three, the double strength, which is prescription only. That has 900 billion colony forming units, CFUs, instead of 25 billion. So what I do is I, I uh, we give you a packet of VSO number three, double strength, 900 billion. You mix it in the, in a bag and you infuse it inside yourself and you wait 30 minutes and then, then you can go to the bathroom if you want to. But the idea is restoring your microbiome as a way to get yourself healthier. There's even links now to cardiovascular events. There's a marker called TMAO that if your TMAO levels are elevated, you're at increased risk for heart attacks and strokes. And it has nothing to do with the, the heart and brain. It actually has everything to do with the bowels. The bowels make this marker. So there's a link, we've proven it, there's a link between poor gut health and heart attacks and strokes. So this, um, this study was fascinating and I, wanted, I want you to understand why your microbiome is affecting you. We're just scratching the surface on stool testing, but I want to tell you that you've, I've had numerous patients come to me and say, oh, I've already had a stool test, they said it was normal. Not all testing is created equal, guys. Most of the time when a conventional doctor does stool testing, all they're looking for is, um, is parasites. That's all, they're looking for ova and parasites. So most Americans don't have parasites. That's not as common in America. Um, and so if, you're, if you've gone overseas, then of course you can have parasites. And we do have some parasites here. But now we can do advanced stool testing. And this is what a picture of an advanced stool test looks like that we order through my practice. Um, and you can tell all kinds of things. Now this is just the summary page. I won't go over detail. But it gives you a few things. So here's infection. Is there any parasites? And then it goes over inflammation. So this person had um, EPX, which is an eosinophilic protein X, meaning um, the immune system is attacking some sort of food, usually is what elevates EPX. And then this person also had too much IgA, meaning there's some sort of imbalance where the immune system has to release antibodies to try to keep whatever's in there at bay. And it can be a food. It can be that the food's coming across and inflammatory, so the immune system is making more mucus to try to push it away. And then it goes over insufficiency. Are you making enough stomach acid? Are you making enough enzymes? Are you digesting your food properly? Because if you're not digesting your food, there is a bacteria that will digest your food, and chances are you're not gonna like the consequences of, or the metabolites of that bacteria as much as you enjoy consuming the food yourself. And then imbalance, are you making enough, um, are you eating enough fiber? With that fiber, fiber feeds our microbiome. That is the food for our bacteria. So if you're like most Americans and you're not eating enough fiber, then you just can't grow the right bacteria. Once you stop growing the right bacteria, then the little bit of fiber you do eat, the fibers turn into toxic chemicals like propionic acid and, and acetic acid. And those things actually prove, we've proven that it causes anxiety. If you've got healthy bacteria, like this person did not, then you will actually be making beneficial compounds. So inbutyrate is the beneficial compound that's made by the gut bacteria. Inbutyrate feeds your own intestinal cells. So this is that symbiotic relationship I was talking about earlier. If, you're, if you don't have the right bacteria, then you can't feed off of them. Those bacteria break down nutrients and give you nutrients. Inbutyrate is one of those nutrients that helps build colonocytes, which are the, the, the cells of the colon. So you need those bacteria. And then the, the last part of this test is it gives you a, a, a gut diversity. How simple or how diverse is your gut? Do you have numerous different types of bacteria or do you have a very simple meat and potatoes kind of bacteria? Or do you have all kinds of colors like eggplant and, and cauliflower and blueberries and all the different colors of the rainbow that you can eat in vegetables? So if you're struggling with autoimmunity or if you're struggling with IBS or any kind of intestinal symptoms, autoimmunity, and you haven't investigated your bowels and you haven't worked on your microbiome, then you're missing the picture. Even conventional medicine is catching up. They're doing fecal transplants on people with ulcerative colitis. So stop struggling. If you have symptoms, if you're struggling, then look up a functional medicine doctor, come see us and um, work on your microbiome and heal it. That way you can finally get to um, optimal health. You can reverse autoimmunity. It's difficult, it's tough, it's a long path, but you can do it. So if you're tired of suffering, try to reverse it. 
Um, I hope this video was helpful. Please share it, like it, um, tag someone that you know that may have ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, or any autoimmune disease, and um, feel free to ask any questions or leave any comments. This journal that I'm referencing is by Paramsothy, P-A-R-A-M-S-O-T-H-Y, um, and it's in the Lancet article in 2017, uh, March 2017. Okay, so I hope this was helpful. Like and share it.